So thank you everybody for attending. Uh, my name is Jamie McCormick, I'm Managing Director of Bitcoin Marketing Team. I'm just going to flick through this very quickly here as well. That's basically who I am. I've been working in crypto since 2014. Um, in terms of how I got here into the crypto space, so I qu classically trained in marketing, member of the Marketing Institute. I worked for 12 years in the video games industry prior to getting into crypto, specifically in virtual currencies, um, and then five years in blockchain as well. Uh, I ended up designing, uh, primarily because of advertising fraud, three tracking and accreditation systems. Uh, did one in video games, did one in Facebook, and then a generic platform as well. And we've integrated the tracking and accreditation methodology that we use into over 10 crypto projects as well. I manage about 12 million advertising across this. So, why you're here. Um, just to run through kind of the topics that I'm gonna be talking about. So we're gonna have a look at the smart approach in terms of a marketing plan, the importance of measuring, how modern tracking and accreditation works, some of the different challenges that are there to measuring, uh, the pitfalls if you're relying exclusively on Google Analytics, the benefits of effective tracking, uh, a few examples of what happens when tracking goes wrong, and uh, then we're gonna have a look at uh, a real life example of a conversion funnel and specifically how measurement improve that. So, in terms of being smart, for any marketers in the room, you're probably familiar with this, it's an acronym for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Uh, within digital marketing, taking a smart approach lets a crypto company really measure all of the different activities that you're doing to see what's working. This is good and bad. And it's really important that you tailor this against your specific KPIs. Now, every type of project is different. If you're selling a hardware wallet, it might be e-commerce sales. If you're doing an exchange, you might have to do onboarding process, trading, trading volume, uh, and then there's various different types of KPIs that you have. And what this lets you do then is really build specific tactics in relevant marketing channels for your different audiences there. You can measure them so you can really find out what's working, driving traffic to your website, into your conversion funnel, specifically through your conversion funnel and onto sales. You wanna have it so that it's achievable with your resources, skills, and budgets. It's realistic in terms of your expectations against your company KPIs, and that you can find your audience in the right place at the right time with the right message. Now, when you combine correctly implemented tracking and accreditation, you can see things for their true impact. So good or bad? You know, not every advertising campaign is gonna be brilliant. Not every advertising campaign is gonna be poor. You know, often you're gonna have situations where you have some good, some bad. You might have, say, 100 publishers sending you traffic from a particular advertising network, but there's only actually three or four of them that are really generating most of the sales that you're getting in there as well. So once you can see what's good, you can focus efforts there. Once you can see what's poor, you can cut it off and redistribute that budget around then as well. So in terms of measuring, you know, anyone who's using digital marketing, it is one of the most measurable activities that a company can do, and you need to have your tracking in place. If you don't have tracking in place, you can never really measure anything other than at kind of a generic overall level as well. So when you're trying to do digital marketing, tracking, and accreditation, you need to have your platform configured. So when traffic is hitting your website, you're adding URL parameters. So people may be familiar with UTM tags that feed into Google Analytics, but you can add a lot of custom values onto these as well. These need to be fed into the link prior to being sent to your website or to an app store as well. Once you have that in place then, you need to be able to take that data, feed it into your own user registration database, and then pull those reports into a marketing report, which is lined up with your KPIs. And then finally, once you have it, you can act on that report. And we'll have a look at this. So knowing what's good is great because you can focus budget there. Knowing what's bad lets you avoid wasted spend. So if you're running an advertising campaign for $10,000, you should know after about $1,000 or $2,000 whether it's actually gonna work or not. And if it's not working, cut it and move, it, move the budget elsewhere. Also, having the data as well has a lot of applications beyond it. You can find problems with your conversion funnel. You can find uh, some strange behavior that's going on, anomalies. You know, in video games, we found all sorts of products with product design. You know, there might be specific points within a game that were deep into the game that were actually broken. Um, in a conversion funnel, in the example we'll show later on, there was two points that were losing over 60% of the users going through. So when you're dropping a lot of money on campaigns and they're not really going the whole way through, that's gonna cost you a lot of money as well. Now once you can see what is working and you can fix it, you can focus and improve over time. So in terms of modern tracking and accreditation, you know, overall your traffic's gonna be mixed up from a couple of different sources. 
So you have your organic traffic, which is gonna give you a baseline that's coming in. So this is coming in from your SEO. This is coming in from any media that you're doing in terms of PR. You've also then got traffic that's being driven from your communications. So this is your blogs, your social media uh, posts, and then you've got your advertising traffic then as well. Now, I know our host series with podcasts as well, so equally you can use promo codes where you don't have a link to measure and link it into this sort of a methodology as well. Now, the key thing to remember here is if you don't tag communications or advertising activities, you're never gonna be able to measure them after the fact. It's very, very, very hard after somebody has registered to then try and find out where they came from. So if you add the information when you're sending it, whether it's through a Google AdWords campaign, whether it's through an ad campaign with someone like CoinZilla or Coin Traffic, uh, podcasts, social media posts, you can do that. Uh, in terms of PR, obviously PR, they strip out quite a lot of the links, but you can use timestamp information to kind of cross-reference when traffic came in and link that back generally to particular types of activities. Um, and especially when it comes to communication measuring, like we've integrated this with several uh, of our clients who have uh, community management teams. So when they take kind of a unified approach to measuring activities, they can see, okay, well, we're working across Facebook, we're working across Twitter, we're working across Medium, we're working across YouTube. And what they can find then is, well, Twitter is actually getting us five times the amount of traffic, Facebook is getting us a lot less, Medium's getting us a steady amount. And they can use that then to kind of repurpose their time and their effort. So they spend less time on the channels that are giving them less results, and they focus more on the ones that are. So, in terms of some of the challenges that you have to measurement as well, now I've managed a number of marketing teams uh, prior to getting into crypto, and human error is one of the big ones. Now, going back to my games career, we had about eight different people on our team. None of them were trained to the same standard. We had people in from South Africa, we had people from Ireland, from England, Italy, Poland, Russia, Germany. Everyone was digitally marketing qualified, but no one had the same training. So we really had to give that standard training to the entire team so that they could do it as well. Adblocks plugins really caused a big issue. So you've got the likes of Brave where you've got default ad blocking coming in. So in this particular event for SFBW, we were running campaigns with Brave, and because of Adblock and because of reliance on Google Analytics, we found it very, very, very hard to actually measure the results. We could see the traffic coming in, but it was very hard to cross-reference that because of this. In terms of script blocking plugins, it's the same approach. You've got cookie blocking as well. So say for instance with here we had to, you know, you had a, a, an e-commerce tag or a user ID that was being set by Google Analytics and this was being shared into the Eventbrite. And that wasn't being passed at some point because of cookie blocking that was going on. Now also, in many cases you've got advertising channels that won't or they can't provide optimization data. So if you have a network that you're talking to and they won't either give you a publisher ID or a website domain for the traffic that's coming in, don't work with them. You've got no way to optimize it. And also if they're doing that, they probably have something that they're trying to hide as well. You've also then got under-reporting if you're relying exclusively on third-party analytics platforms. So generally, in non-crypto space, you might have a 10, 20% discrepancy between analytics data and uh, your own uh, database. In crypto, that can be up to 40%. I see people more privacy conscious, people using more ad block, um, and so on. Now that feeds into relying exclusively on Google Analytics. So we've worked with lots of clients when it came to analytics. Often they're set up in terms of there's a tracking script set up on the page and that's recording, but often they're very often misconfigured. You don't have event tracking set up, you don't have conversion goals set up, and it just makes it very difficult for you to read them as well. Uh, as we said, there's under-reporting up to 40%. You've also got a very separate uh, separation of analytics from your underlying databases. So if you're running an exchange, you know, your exchange database has all of your information there. You might not necessarily be feeding it straight in. So analytics is always going to be sitting on top. Now, if your analytics is showing less than your real database, that's normal. If it's showing more, something's wrong. And again, it's misconfigured. If you don't have, sorry, if you have untagged traffic as well, this can combine with your organic traffic and really skew your stats. And really, you know, the whole point of tracking is really building two different things. You know, you've got the John Wanamaker dilemma, which is half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. I don't know which half. By doing tagging, you can see exactly what it is. And then you've also got the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule as well. Now, when you get tracking right, it lets you see at a very holistic level uh, all of your marketing and communication activities side by side in one report. 
So this can be your own team stuff, your organic traffic, stuff coming in from PR, stuff coming in from third-party agencies, and everything else. And you can measure them on a like-for-like -like basis. The approach that we've always taken has meant that you've got one report that you look at from your own data, and then you can reconcile that against 30 or 40 different reports from platforms and see if there's anomalies there as well. So if they're, saying, if they're measuring lots of leads and you're not, that's one thing. If they're measuring lots of traffic and you're not, that's another thing there as well. Now, once you have the tracking in place properly, you can identify positive traffic sources and really focus your money and your time and your effort on these as well. In some cases, you've got, it's very hard to get volume and quality at the same time. Uh, and often what you'll have is you've got an overall channel, and within that you've got a couple of traffic sources that generally over and over and over are bringing in safe bets. So once you can identify a safe bet traffic source, you can focus your budget there and maximize that out. You can identify negative traffic sources. So these are ones that are bringing you in nothing. They might be bringing in spend. They might be bringing in uh, users or registrations, but they might not be going the whole way through your funnel, and you can filter them out. Now, often what we'll see is you have a, a channel where you have some good traffic sources and then a lot of bad ones. So in one case, we were running a campaign with a client. They had about, I think, 60 different publishers that were sending traffic into the campaign. Two of them, those publishers, were generating 80% of the traffic and spend on that. So when we tried to, you know, the other 58 were bringing in lower volumes and they're bringing in registrations. But when we cut those two specific traffic sources out, the whole campaign improved. Spend dropped, but the conversion rates all went up, click-through rates went up, and revenues came up, and the ROI came through from that as well. So really, you know, it boils down to saving money. You know, you want to save money on marketing spend. Also, when you map out your conversion funnel, and again, we'll have a look at an example of one of these in a moment, you can really identify bottlenecks in your process. So we've worked with lots of teams where the developers made a conversion funnel that they thought was okay, but in reality, it wasn't the most intuitive for end users. So by mapping this out, mapping out every single step, looking at ratios between them, and finding out what was working and what wasn't, we were able to identify dropout points. Some small, some big. So once you also have the product as well, and you've identified that there's a problem, you can identify barriers to product usage. So in a lot of cases, you have to fully go through a funnel before you can use the platform. And if you have a barrier there that's stopping people getting into it, you need to be able to improve that there as well. Now, development teams, all the ones that I've worked with, love data. You know, the only thing that will get over an attitude in terms of, oh, I built this and it's great, what's the problem with it? It's like, look, yes, you did build it, but there's a problem there. The data is telling me the problem. It's not me. It's, there's actually a problem there that's there as well. Now, once you have it and you've got the recording in place, it's very easy to quantify the changes. You know, you put a fix in on a particular day. You've got the stats all the way up to the previous day. And then from the day on, you can see the improvement. If it goes up, great. It's going to make your life a lot easier the next time you're looking for problems. If it goes down or there's no change, you can roll back and look at something else. And really what you want to do is by building this approach and really mapping every single traffic source against your KPIs, you can look at the metrics there. You can find that certain traffic sources have higher metrics. So we'd often see, you know, say with an affiliate, you might have an affiliate that has very low volume but they've got a high click-through rate and a high product usage. And that might be coming from a text post or some information about it there as well. Whereas doing banners, you know, you've got a lot more volume, you've got a lot more traffic, but the quality is very poor. Now, equally, when we look at, say, some of the crypto ad networks that are there, the standard banner sizes that are there have very poor click-through rates. But some of the custom HTML5 placements that they have, which are much more prominent, cost a little bit more, but the click-through rates are five, six, seven times better. And when we kind of measure that out and you're paying on a CPM, that makes a big difference. So what happens when tracking goes wrong? Firstly, you can fail to identify systematic problems within your product design. It's buried there. People don't look at reports or databases in a lot of cases there, and they just continue working away on something there as well. You can waste finite marketing budget on activities that are generating no or poor results, and they also bring down your overall numbers. You can waste a lot of team effort, say if you have a communications team that's working across six or seven different channels, and you're giving equal effort to them all, but there's only three of them that are generating what you actually want, you, know, you can save a lot of time and stress and hassle for them just focusing most of their time on the three that are working. In terms of skewing stats, 
if you have a lot of traffic coming in or you've got a load of poor results, this can really skew your stats and you can kind of change that then. And you can really focus on traffic sources, which, you know, you, you have kind of situations where you've got middling ones. So you might have users that you've got decent traffic coming from a particular publisher or a keyword, for instance, but they're only getting halfway through the conversion funnel and repeatedly there as well. So while it looks good if you're looking at the first KPI, which is an initial registration, but you look at, say, KPI 4, they're not getting past that point there as well. And sometimes you might focus a lot of effort and time and money into those campaigns because they look good from their initial KPI, but they're not actually going the full way. Also, what can happen is if you take you know, a, a broad sweep approach, you may have a marketing channel, like the example I gave earlier on, where you have one or two bad parties in there as well. And you cut the whole channel because you're getting rid of those one or two. So being able to pick out and pick and choose and really see every single traffic source, compare them like for like, and then surgically remove the one or two that are causing problems, that makes a big, big, big difference there as well. So it's kind of seeing the wood from the trees. Also, you know, we've had situations where you've got a lot of ad fraud. This could be amplified because if you're focusing on the, right, the wrong areas, you can have unauthorized incentivized traffic. You know, faucets are kind of the bane of the crypto industry when it comes to advertising. They've good and bad elements in terms of the onboarding, but generally you've got a lot of ad fraud that's going on in there from humans. Now coming on to kind of a real case example for a conversion funnel. So we have a client who's in the crypto finance space. They've got a complex seven step funnel and you had to get through this before you can use it. So starting off, we have the traffic. This had to hit one of their landing pages and then we qualified the traffic with the information on this then as well. They then had quite a, long multi-step registration process. They then had to activate their email account. They had to set up two-factor authentication. They had to enter in some personal data. They had to go through the KYC process, which everybody loves. And then they had to accept the program terms and conditions. And then after that point, they could get into the platform and use it. Now this is similar to an exchange, but there's a lot of platforms in the crypto space that have something similar to this as well. Now we implemented tracking with these guys a year ago, and we've put tens and tens and tens and thousands of leads through this system and this approach and this methodology since we've been doing this as well. And we were able to map out every single one of those steps, look at the ratios between them all as well, and then work with their team to implement the improvements. So in terms of what we did, we had the landing page. So we redesigned their landing pages. So they were sending traffic to the home page. We built cul-de-sac or dead end road uh, landing pages, and then we got a nice design that we were happy with. We did A-B testing using Google Optimize to kind of see which ones were best performing, and then we routed the traffic and focused the traffic into the pages that were working best. With the registration funnel, they had about 12 or 13 different input fields that people had to fill information in. We really just said to them, I was like, what do you actually need? And that was about six. So they can still put that information in once they're in the platform, but during the registration, it was that. We also reorganized it so it was a bit more intuitive for users as well. In terms of the email activation, so one of the problems that they were having was a lot of their activation emails were getting hit by spam filters. So we got DKIM authentication uh, and this improved email deliverability. We also rearranged the subject line so it was clear that you need to click this to continue. And that brought up between step one registration and step two email activation numbers by 6%. In terms of the next step with the personal data and the KYC, we work with them to rearrange the process and also they had to kind of re-engineer some of the elements with their KYC provider. But once we did this, you know, they were losing, I think 52, sorry, 48% of people weren't passing KYC. They were just getting to that step, looking at it and going, no, this is too complex. And at the end of doing this as well, that went up to I think 75%. So we improved the numbers by 35% just by re-engineering that. Also, they had a two-factor authentication step this point here was causing a lot of problems. They were losing over 30% of people. So if you do the maths here, you know, you have 1,000 people coming in. They were losing 6% at step two. At step four, they were losing 30 odd percent. And then at step five or six, they were losing 30% there as well. You know, the funnel there was losing, because of its design, over half of the people that were going through. Now we had to work with their marketing team, their product management team, their development team, but overall we did it led to an improvement of 40% of customers going through the process. And from the same spend and the same activities, we brought their sales up by 20% as well. Uh, we also then cut the channels that they were using by 50%. So that in, we had less overhead, time, effort, the whole shebang there as well. 
So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, we have a booth inside in the hall. Uh, we're offering an hour's free consultation and a chance to win uh, a nice bottle of Irish Teelings whiskey here as well. So if, you want, if you're interested in having a chat about your projects and tracking and accreditation, we're more than happy to have a chat with you next door. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time and attention. I appreciate you listening. Sure. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Sorry, I'm, bl Ooh, I'm blinded here, so I can't see. Nope. Fair enough. We'll move on to the next speaker. Cool. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> The same approach you can map into any sort of, yeah, it does. So we learned this in video games. You know, and video games had a very complex, you know, if people get them to register, they had to download six or seven gigs, which you couldn't track. Then they'd have to log in, go through character creation, play the game, go through all the products there as well. So the same approach works for the onboarding process, but then equally it works for applications as well, end to end. So, cool, okay, thank you very much. Oh. Okay, so... So the question was, what... What programs? What programs do you use to track user behavior yeah. analytics? Yeah. So the approach that we're doing can integrate in with any of those visualization tools or analytics. It's more methodology that feeds it straight into your database. So there's a bit of coding that's required at the start to get it integrated in your site. And then usually what we do is we'd have... Some clients use Mongo database, some people using Splunk, some people using SQL. Once the data's in there, we structure the reports, and that can feed into any sort of visualization tool that you have. So the approach that we're taking, there's no like analytics, pixels, anything. It's just there's a methodology that once you get it in, it's in there, and then you can then use whatever tools you want to use, whether it's a CSV report or an SQL mix panel, whatever it is, to actually visualize that data. Okay? Cool. We're going to have to leave it there. Right. Thank you so much, Jamie.